Hello, everybody, and thank you, Tamar, for the kind uh, introduction and for putting together this uh, uh, online event. Uh, we can uh, uh, move on uh, directly and start to move on to the next slide. Um, we'll start by analyzing uh, the results, the election. Actually, it looks like uh, ages ago, but it's uh, just, uh, just over a week ago, Israelis uh, and, uh, and all of us also in the diaspora woke up to a new, a rather surprising uh, reality, because uh, only within a few months uh, the elections took place again. That's unprecedented, of course. And the results were very different uh, than the previous round just a few months ago. So we'll uh, uh, speak about the results and then uh, analyze them, and then what, obviously uh, what are the implications, both uh, political policy and, and uh, legal. What we're seeing here is the new, uh, the new Knesset, as of uh, last week, and um, the, the winners, uh, I'd start with who are the winners and who are the losers. So the apparent winner is the Israel Beitenu party with the uh, eight seats up from uh, five seats. Abdelikdor Lieberman uh, was able to rebrand himself uh, as uh, a politician uh, uh, protecting uh, uh, the interests of uh, secular and, conser and, uh, and traditional uh, Israelis vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, strong political power of the ultra-Orthodox parties, and uh, politically it proved itself, and he, his power grew dramatically. A blue and white party, although they have 33 versus 35, um, um, they can be considered winners. In terms of actual absolute number of votes, they got more votes, and uh, and uh, they um, secured the largest party uh, status, and of course uh, preserved their position as the uh, as uh, a ruling party or an option on or an alternative to a ruling party for an outfit that was created just a few months ago um, uh, to be able to. Uh, uh, present such a good outcome with just within uh, a few months after many uh, have already um, uh, uh, doubted their ability to stick together, it's, uh, it's considered uh, 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 an achievement. And of course, the, the joint Arab, uh, the joint list of uh, uh, four Arab parties that uh, from a combined outcome of 10 seats, uh, they went up now to 13 seats, uh, a dramatic uh, rise. It is a reflection of a uh, of, uh, high turnout among the Arab sector uh, and other factors that we will touch upon uh, soon. But that's uh, uh, probably alongside with Lieberman's outcome, a, a dramatic outcome. In terms of the losers, so Likud went down, the combination of Likud and Mr. Kahlon, the finance ministers, Kulanu, if they were in April 35 plus 4, 39 altogether, they went down to 32, uh, which is uh, um, uh, obviously a, a, a sharp decline. So they can be put in the in the losers column. And Yamina, uh, uh, Bennett and Shaked, uh, the National Religious Party, a combination of of actually uh, three different uh, national religious parties, including uh, uh, Bennett and Shaked. If you count Bennett and Shaked, they did not cross the threshold, but they had almost four seats last time in the five seats of the uh, Jewish Home Party. Um, so it, they started with now nine, they went down to seven, and actually the hope was that with a new Shaked uh, rejuvenated uh, leadership, uh, initially they started with 12 seats in the polls, so it's a, it's a big uh, uh, disappointment uh, for them. Uh, the ultra-Orthodox parties, by and large, uh, 16 seats, as they uh, had uh, beforehand, although Shas party went up, uh, uh, both in, in terms of absolute number of votes and uh, seats, they went up from 8 to 9, so Shas had a, a relatively uh, nice success. Uh, Labour and Democratic uh, Union altogether, uh, um, pretty similar to the last time. We can uh, uh, move, uh, now we'll move uh, to the next slide. Uh, the next slide actually demonstrates something that uh, uh, we've talked about uh, already uh, in, in, in previous conversations. We can move to the next slide. Uh, uh, okay, so that, that, that slide actually uh, demonstrates, sorry for the movement, yeah. That slide actually demonstrates something um, 
that I find very interesting that uh, while there is uh, our politics are extremely dynamic, the relationship between the different blocs is extremely stagnant. So we see the number of, uh, say, the Arab parties from uh, 2009 until 2019, anywhere between 11 and 13. So we're seeing actually there's nothing much has changed. If we look at the ultra-Orthodox parties, except for uh, decline in 2015, the, the number 16 is a reflection of now, of what happened in April, and even in 2009 they had 16. The center-left parties... Again, there are almost around 44, 45. 2015 can also be counted as 45 if you split up Kahlon. So it's very, very stagnant, the Zionist center-left parties. And uh, the, 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 big, the major systemic difference that, looked, uh, that took place this time is the fact that Mr. Lieberman extracted himself from, uh, uh, from the position of an automatic member in the right-wing camp and now he has a category of his own. And, and, and here we see a dramatic decline if the right wing used to be uh, 49 in 09, 49 uh, back in April, uh, 50, uh, it was 49 if we split up Kahlon. So it's a very stable around 49, 50 uh, for the past decade. And, uh, and this time it's down to 39 because Lieberman is no longer... Uh, 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 defining himself as an automatic part of that camp because he redefined himself around the uh, issues of religion and state and integration of the ultra-Orthodox community. So this is really what systemically has changed. We can move on to the uh, next slide. Um, so what we really... Um, what is it that we know and what is it that we don't know as a result of the election? I'll actually start on the right-hand side uh, with what we know. What we know is that the idea of unilateral annex annexation that was uh, put on the table just before the election, there is no majority for unilateral annexation vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis settlements in the West Bank or uh, Part or the entire West Bank, uh, those ideas were surfaced before the election, including by uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu himself. There is no majority for that. The, uh, uh, what's going to determine the agenda on the Israeli-Palestinian issue um, uh, in the next uh, upcoming months will be probably the Trump plan and the parameters that, will, uh, that it will include. And, and, and nobody expects any dramatic change in either a direction in this issue. But annexation is off the table. What we also know is that the immediate, uh, uh, the, the cluster of initiatives that were uh, designed to uh, uh, quite dramatically undermine the independence of the judiciary, those initiatives are off, off the table. There's no majority for, uh, for undermining uh, and, uh, and causing irreversible uh, uh, damage to the institutions of rule of law and to the independent judiciary. There is just no majority for that. So this is, again, uh, another result that we know uh, 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 a result of this election, regardless of the uncertainty. Um, what we also know is that uh, Israeli democracy emerged as a winner in, uh, uh, from the perspective that the actual day of the election uh, uh, we had a free and fair election, uh, no riots, no uh, violence. Nobody is uh, uh, trying to question the outcome and, and the purity of the election and so on. Uh, and as uh, some of you know, those questions were raised before the election. And the election committee proved itself, uh, it proved its competence, and, uh, and the institutions, the, the, the state institution that ran the election ran a proper election. So in this respect, our democracy is emerging as a winner. And of course, the turnout issue, the turnout figures that we're going to discuss in, in, a, in a moment uh, also uh, by and large demonstrated that Israelis showed up, uh, have faith in our democracy, in our democratic system. And in this respect, our democracy, uh, we, can, we can be proud of, the, of, uh, of this uh, outcome. What we don't know, which is, again, unprecedented, we don't know who's going to be prime minister. So now we're moving to the uncertainty. That's, again, never did we have an election, except for 1984, that we had a unique case. In April, we thought we knew who's the prime minister. Now we don't know. It's either Mr. Netanyahu, perhaps either Mr. Gantz, 
or a third anonymous candidate from the Likud that might replace Netanyahu within the Likud, or another election. So we, we really, uh, in an unprecedented manner, we, the election results have been published, and we do not know who's the prime minister. It's also a reflection of the weaknesses of our electoral system, something, by the way, that uh, uh, we've been strong and long-standing advocates for reforming our electoral system. Maybe we'll uh, touch upon it uh, later. What we also don't know is what will be the makeup of the next coalition. Will it be a national unity government uh, with the ultra-Orthodox parties, without the ultra-Orthodox parties, uh, with the smaller parties in the fringes, without them? So there are many, all, all options are on the table, as was uh, uh, coined in, in other uh, instances for other circumstances, but this uh, is also relevant uh, in, uh, in our case. And what we also don't know is uh, what will be the outcome should the prime minister uh, be indicted. The decision might take place. Uh, Edna will touch upon it soon. Uh, the decision might take place uh, um, uh, in November or December, and we don't know whether it will affect the, the, uh, whether the prime minister will uh, form a government and whether he will be able to serve or not. There are legal ambiguities and political ambiguities around that. So... Uh, much uncertainty is also uh, uh, still uh, um, our our lot. We can move on to the next slide now, and uh, uh, and and to the next slide. And uh, so so what has changed between now and and uh, and the April elections? So number one, a voter turnout. Everybody expected uh, that voter turnout will be suppressed. As we've seen in other parts of the world, in the UK, when they had a repeat election in 1974, uh, there was a decline of 6% in the level of participation. In, in Greece, they had a, a, a rerun, and there was a, a, back in 2015, there was a decline by 7%. Uh, Spain had also similar, uh, uh, a similar decline. So uh, there was a general expectation that uh, Israelis would not show up again uh, just a few months uh, after the election, and and Israelis did show up. Uh, there was a, a a rise of of more than a percent. We we went up from 68 percent to almost 70 percent, and and that all that number also includes Israelis that are overseas and so on. So it's actually a very very uh, high figure uh, comparatively. Uh, also in comparison to April, but also if we compare it uh, globally. So in this respect, we can be proud. Israelis are involved. Israelis uh, demonstrate that they have faith in the system, and, uh, and, uh, and all the more so with respect to the Arab sector. There was a dramatic rise from about uh, 49% to close to 60%. Uh, then three main factors are, number one, the fact that the joint list uh, of four Arab parties uh, reunited, uh, there was a certain sense um, that uh, uh, the Arab vote might matter mo mo might matter more this time. Mr. Gantz uh, uh, communicated quite uh, intensively uh, uh, by using a, a Arab media outlet to demonstrate that he cares about some of the issues like personal security and, and crime prevention. And uh, so, so was a, there was a certain sense that uh, voting. It matters and might have an effect. And, and finally, uh, 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 Mr. Netanyahu's uh, pre-election camera campaign to deploy cameras uh, within the ballot stations uh, within the Arab sector under the suspicion that, uh, quote-unquote, the Arabs are about to uh, um, uh, steal the election, or th that was a sort of underlying uh, message, uh, it backfired and uh, aggravated many Arab citizens who, who then uh, showed up. So we can move on to the next slide. That, that explains the uh, rise in the uh, Arab uh, turnout, and what we're seeing are overall turnout figures uh, uh, with the historical comparisons, so, and, uh, and uh, with the Arab population, that we're seeing this uh, rather uh, dramatic uh, increase. We can move on to the next slide now. And... Um, what I thought of sharing uh, here is how did our Arab uh, uh, minority, uh, uh, the members of the Arab minority, how did they uh, vote? 
And what we're seeing is 82% uh, support for the uh, joint list. So there's almost a monopoly of that list. It's combined of four different lists and uh, uh, the main uh, mainstream and, and uh, uh, politicians that represent the Arab minority. Although we are also seeing that there was some small level of support for the uh, Zionist uh, parties, mainly blue and white, uh, although it would be fair to mention that uh, uh, blue and white, we can move on to the next slide, blue and white um, support came mainly from the Druze uh, community. So among the Druze, uh, there was uh, 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 about half of uh, uh, the Druze um, um, uh, citizens uh, voted for uh, blue and white, and the Druze uh, are, uh, make up about... Uh, a little more than 10% of our Arab minority, but they're obviously uh, uh, the political uh, uh, patterns of behavior of this community are very different than the uh, than the rest of our uh, Arab uh, citizens. Um, we see here the overall number uh, uh, of uh, votes for the Arab uh, uh, votes by Arab uh, Isra Arab citizens or Israeli Arab citizens. It went up by 130,000 from uh, about 340,000 to 470,000. So that's you know that uh, that explains uh, the outcome. We can uh, uh, move to the next slide now. So what happened with the Likud? Um, the Likud underperformed in its uh, strongholds, and we can move to the next slide and see um, uh, some examples. Those are the outcomes of the. Uh, the general outcomes in development towns, you know, towns like Bet She'an and Kiryat Shmone in the north, and uh, Sderot, Ofakim, Netivot, uh, uh, Yerucham, Dimona, the development towns that are mainly in the north and in the south that are considered strong Likud strong, uh, uh, or traditional Likud strongholds, there was a, uh, a major decline of about 5% in support for the Likud. Obviously, the Likud remains the largest party in development towns, but uh, but there is a, a, a decline, and um, sorry about that. And, uh, and 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 what we are seeing that basically the votes that left the Likud, by and large, went to Shas and Israel Beitenu. So Shas actually increased its support not among uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, Sephardi voters, but they expanded uh, to the periphery of traditional uh, Sephardi uh, voters, which has been the case with Shas in the past as well. Unlike uh, uh, UTJ, the Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox party, that generally its size reflects the size of the uh, demography of uh, Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox uh, 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 citizens, with Shas, traditionally, there was always a, 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 a certain portion of Shas supporters that did not come, uh, that do not reflect the size of the Sephardi uh, 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 ultra-Orthodox community, but rather traditional Israelis. Shas had a, a, a fabulous uh, campaign using the slichot uh, 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 that are now taking place before Yom Kippur and touched upon the uh, emotions of their potential supporters, and they also benefited from the um, certain level of disappointment or or um, fatigue from Mr. Netanyahu among that base, and therefore there was a an increase with the support for Shas and an increase for Israel Beitenu uh, in development towns of uh, of those mainly uh, uh, former supporters of the Likud who uh, felt that they. Uh, 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 identified with Mr. Lieberman's focus on uh, rejecting the uh, uh, um, the, um, the sort of the traditional Netanyahu deal with the ultra orthodox that provides them monopoly on domestic uh, affairs. We can move on to the next slide. Politically, it's probably a more important slide because that uh, reflects the support for the Likud in the in the Likud. Uh, strongholds, the sort of middle-sized towns like Afula, Kiryat Ata, Ashkelon, Natania, Ashdod, Be'er Sheva. This is really where the sort of the, 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 uh, the, the, the strongly put Likud base comes from. And we're seeing that quite uh, 
systematically a decline in a city like Ashdo, Ashkelon, an 8% decline for the Likud, uh, 5% in Afula, a 7% in Natanya. Natanya is a very, very traditional uh, Likud uh, uh, stronghold. And what happened in, in those towns is that generally most of the votes went either to Shas or Israel Beitenu, and a small number also went to Blue and White, uh, that in return contributed some uh, votes to Mr. Lieberman. So there were also some, uh, and we can move on to the next slide, there were also some center-left uh, uh, Israelis who identified themselves as belonging to the center-left or, or center-right that uh, formerly supported uh, uh, blue and white and this time uh, uh, were attracted to Lieberman's uh, uh, new agenda and were impressed by his commitment to this agenda. And, uh, and the fact that Blue and White did not decline is because they got some new votes of former uh, Kahlon voters uh, that moved on to, um, uh, to Blue and White. We're seeing here in this slide the, the stability and support for Blue and White in the Blue and White strongholds. Towns like uh, Hoda Sharon, Givatayim, Kfar Saba, Ranana, Ramat Gan, we're seeing uh, phenomenally high numbers of uh, 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 shares of support for uh, blue and white and, uh, and a very stable uh, in comparison to April. What uh, uh, some of you who are more aware of Israeli uh, uh, geography and, 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 the, and demography, those towns are generally uh, belong to the higher socioeconomic uh, uh, categories. So we're seeing that generally blue and white supporters come from the higher socioeconomic categories in towns like uh, the, the towns that are uh, listed in this slide, whereas the Likud strongholds are, are more, you know, cities like uh, Natanya and Ashdod and, and Be'er Sheva are more in the in middle categories of uh, socioeconomic uh, um, uh, categorization. So we're seeing that the sort of the Likud and blue and white uh, uh, difference is actually a reflection of uh, some deeper uh, 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 deeper divides uh, in Israeli society. Uh, we can move on. So the uh, political timeline, uh, some of you who have greater interest can go over it. It's quite complex what's uh, written here, but it's basically when does the president grant the mand mandate and, and, and what are the timelines and so on. Uh, yesterday the mandate to form the government, 28-day mandate was uh, uh, granted to Mr. Netanyahu. He's not expected to succeed. There's also some talk of Mr. Netanyahu returning the mandate before the 28 days expire and not even requesting for the additional traditional 14 days of an extension. Uh, that might be the case because he, uh, 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 there are indications that he's strongly pushing for a third election round and he wants uh, that decision to be made before a decision a final decision on an indictment is made. So, um, uh, uh, but in any case, should Netanyahu return the mandate, then the president is, is uh, expected to assign Mr. Gantz with a mandate to form a government, and Gantz, Mr. Gantz is expected to exhaust his chance and try to uh, think of creative ideas and, 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 and other partners and so on. But, uh, but that, that describes the, the formal uh, uh, timeline. And now we can move on to the next slide, and Edna will uh, uh, take it from here and, and try to synchronize the, the, the political clock with the legal clock and, and how the two are uh, connected. Da Edna, please. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to start um, with the summarizing, reminding us what are the cases against the prime minister. There were uh, several accusations, but now we are uh, speaking about three main cases. First is what is called the case 1000, which deals with illegal gifts that prime minister was receiving or in support, as, as uh, told, even demanding to get from different uh, billionaires uh, in return for assisting them or even without assisting them, just creating dependence of a, a, such a, a senior um, uh, person to these billionaires. The second uh, case is case 2000, which is known as the case of Yediot Achronot versus Israel Ayom, uh, which are two main 
uh, newspapers in Israel, very uh, influential ones. And one is known to be close to prime minister and um, uh, aiming to erode the uh, financial uh, uh, stronghold of Yediot Achronot, which turned out to uh, bring Yediot Achronot to a position of trading the positive coverage demanded by prime minister for curtailing the circulation of Israel Ayom, which of course raises different troubling issues of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of press in Israel, and, and the interference of political influence in those. Uh, both of these cases uh, are a, some to a charge of fraud and breach of trust of the prime minister. Uh, the third one is what is called Bezekwala uh, case, case 4000. Um, again, dealing with the uh, press coverage of prime minister, which was uh, very much interested in changing it to its favor in the Walla internet site, uh, in return of a regulatory breaks to the owner of Walla site, which is also the owner of Bezek Monopoly, a very influential uh, monopoly in the telecommunication field in Israel. Uh, which uh, turned to a very serious charge, not only the serious charge of fraud and breach of trust, but also a bribery charge. Uh, this, this is the one that is the most uh, aiming on Prime Minister. All of them are um, um, having lots of evidence, people, uh, that were from the close circles of the prime minister that they gave testimonies. And uh, these are all, uh, I, we will move to the next slide, thank you. Uh, these were all uh, investigated by the police after accusation made, and police gave recommendations to uh, the attorney general, which announced his decision. Now, uh, in Israel, a high a official uh, people a, are a, a accused only pending hearing. The hearing that the Attorney General is about to um, uh, have uh, to the Prime Minister uh, is dated to the beginning of October, which means Pretty soon, while we are still under the uh, uh, talks of deciding which government and who can form a government. More so, the Attorney General may uh, uh, announce that he will make his final decision on the indictment as early as the end of November. At the beginning, he was said to have that until December, but lately, uh, it was announced that his intentions are to bring the decision, uh, the final decision, uh, at uh, the end of November. These accusations uh, can be, uh, uh, um, are, sorry, the prime minister should, should be uh, uh, brought to court according to these uh, uh, charges. The hearing has, a, a, it gives him an opportunity to argue a case, but only to present new evidence or refute persecutions uh, 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 so the attorney general can drop or less the counts. It's not arguing the case as if it's in court. The Prime Minister itself does not appear before the Attorney General. It's only uh, uh, the, the, his legal advisors. They are supposed to bring either uh, um, um, new uh, position about the evidence that was already argued. For a, a example, the Prime Minister did not answer to some questions during 
the investigation, he's not supposed to bring the new evidence at that point. So it's a very specific uh, step that might give the Attorney General a new uh, 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 perspective of the evidence that were already collected. So he can reconsider his decisions. And this is why this step is very important for Prime Minister, but uh, on the same hand, we must understand that the Attorney General has already decided on the indictment and has very strong evidence for that. What does it mean that a Prime Minister uh, is, been indictment, is under indictment? Can he serve as a Prime Minister? Now, the law in Israel uh, deals with ministers, not with the Prime Minister. If a minister is convicted, he must resign. This is what is in the law. The legal precedent uh, that was, were made already a, a, in several cases uh, a, a, have, a, by, by them it was decided that if a minister is indicted, he must resign or be fired by prime minister. Neither of these apply to the prime minister himself. And, and the question is, what will happen if the prime minister is indicted? Uh, since it's such a high position, um, what the law does say is that prime minister can stay in office until there is a verdict if he's blamed or been brought to charges. And he's not obliged to leave uh, uh, unless Parliament has decided so. But still, since there is this legal precedent um, by, by which ministers have to uh, uh, resign, we are uh, expected to have very strong political and uh, legal a um, um, pressure for the prime minister either to resign or to announce a leave of absence. Now, leave of absence is uh, um, not exactly uh, fitted for this position, since leave of absence is uh, is is uh, a, for a very short period of time. Uh, it cannot exceed 100 days, and um, it, it's not arranged to fit such a, a, a situation. So, actually, uh, there are, we need now either to find uh, some um, interesting new ideas, like the president brought the other day, uh, President Rivlin suggested that the uh, act Netanyahu can be a prime minister, but if actually he's, he'll be indicted, he will resign from his powers, not from the office, and his uh, deputy prime minister, uh, Gantz, would be a prime minister uh, uh, in office. Uh, this is kind of a way to uh, fit all uh, uh, demands and um, still leave uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu as a Prime Minister with this defense of the legal uh, uh, um, situation in Israel, which is of course a much better situation for uh, someone under indictment than being, uh, than being a minister or God forbid, being no minister and no prime minister. We must remind though, that uh, this, prima, this prime minister, Netanyahu, uh, when he was a head of opposition, uh, and uh, Mr. Ulmert was prime minister, he was arguing that the prime minister cannot serve the country uh, for, the, for the best of the country. Uh, when he is uh, under indictment or even before under investigations. So uh, these were surely uh, uh, be part of the a pressure 
presented to uh, Mr. Netanyahu if he will be prime minister and under indictment, even if the law does allow him to keep on serving. Back to you, Yohanan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Edna. Uh, let's move to the next slide. So as you understand, Edna gave a very brief, Edna, Edna can we move to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Edna gave a very brief analysis of the legal uh, aspects and they're extremely complex in their own right. And obviously they have a tremendous and extensive uh, political implications. Uh, to some extent, uh, the reason why we went for an early election in the first time in April uh, for another round all of these have, uh, are heavily affected uh, by those uh, legal woes of the Prime Minister. So uh, that, uh, that really requires us, if we want to understand the political process, to actually immerse ourselves also in the, in the legal aspects. Uh, what we have here is a, the, a few uh, government scenarios or, or coalition scenarios. Um, uh, I'll run through them very briefly. The national unity led by Mr. Netanyahu, it means blue and white and, uh, and Likud with Mr. Netanyahu, but then the question is uh, what will happen if there's an indictment? Basically, if we, if we can distill blue and white's uh, uh, campaign to one promise, it's we will preserve rule of law and will not allow for a prime minister under an, under an indictment to serve. So it will be uh, next to impossible for them now to serve under Mr. Netanyahu in a national unity government and to allow him to continue to run the affairs of state as he tries to clear his name in court. Option number two, national unity government led by uh, blue and white. Um, this obviously uh, will require Likud to give up Netanyahu as a leader. Netanyahu has a very strong grip over the Likud, and it's unclear whether this scenario is, uh, has any high probability at all, at, at least at this uh, point in time. And, of course, then the question would be, should there be such a national unity government, would it be with Mr. Lieberman or, uh, or with the ultra-Orthodox parties? Because even if someone replaces Netanyahu in the Likud, he, uh, uh, I'm saying he because there are no she's that are expected to replace Netanyahu within the Likud. All the potential front runners are males. Uh, uh, they are expected to insist on including uh, um, uh, the ultra orthodox parties because uh, that alliance between the Likud and the ultra orthodox parties has been very politically beneficial for the Likud over the past few decades. And then there's uh, the option of the right-wing government led by Netanyahu and uh, Lieberman uh, caving in or changing his mind. It, I, I don't think there's a very high likelihood for that, but it's an option. Uh, a center-left led by uh, Gantz is, uh, is no longer an option because uh, until uh, yesterday, the ultra-Orthodox parties uh, with the center-left parties could add up to... Uh, 61 votes, now, now they add up to 60, so it's, it's not really an option, unless Mr. Lieberman agrees to, uh, f to serve in a center-left government with external support from the Arab party, something that doesn't sound uh, very likely, but mathematically it's an option. And again, uh, if, finally, the option of a, an early, of a third election is, uh, it cannot be ruled out, unfortunately. I I, I hate to say that, but it's, uh, it is an option. So let's move to the final slide. Um, so assuming there's a national unity government, what substantive opportunities, and I'm sorry that we spoke less about substance and more about uh, the mechanics, uh, legal and, and, and uh, political mechanics, uh, and election mechanics, but what are the substantive opportunities should there a national unity government uh, emerge? So there's an, a real opportunity, if we could, and, lay, and, uh, and Blue and White get together, there's a real opportunity to entrench, based on a broad consensus, entrench our constitutional foundations, rather than crush them, agree on how should the relationship between the different branches of government should be structured. Uh, there's an opportunity to reform our broken and dysfunctional electoral system, there's a major opportunity to promote uh, Jewish pluralism and questions of religion and state. And in this respect, actually on all three uh, 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 issues, 
uh, one can uh, uh, promote reforms and agendas that will reflect a broad, broad majority, a uh, broad consensus and a broad majority support of, uh, of the Israeli population. And finally, it will be a government that will be able to uh, uh, actually deal with the challenges of our economy uh, to promote structural reforms, to deal with the deficit in, a, in an era of uh, growing uh, uh, instability and uh, question marks around the status of the global economy. So, so there are many upsides for our uh, uh, major mainstream center-left, center-right politicians to get together and, and to form a, uh, a national unity government, but uh, that would require uh, some concessions and obviously that would require uh, uh, to see what happens or how the issue of uh, Mr. Netanyahu uh, and his personal legal woes, how, how all of that is factored in. So that's it for now. It was a little long. I hope it was interesting, and we are now available for questions, Tamar. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions that have already come in, and I want to encourage everybody on the, on the line to to write in more questions because we do have a bit of time right now. So the first one is, why did Netanyahu get the mandate to create a coalition and why not Gans? Well, it, it's, um, uh, the law is, is quite ambiguous and in such unique circumstances leaves uh, much room for, uh, for the president to exercise his judgment. In the past, except for 1984, there was, the role of the president was symbolic because um, um, whoever got the mandate to form the government actually got a majority of members of Knesset recommending him, uh, recommending him or her to form the government. And therefore, the president uh, 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 provided the mandate without much judgment. This time... No, none of the candidates got more than 61 recommendations, or recommendations of more than 61 NKs, uh, which represent a, a majority of Knesset members. And therefore, there was a room for the president to exercise judgment. He could say, although Netanyahu got 55 recommendations versus 54 that recommended Mr. Gantz, Blue and White is a larger party. Uh, perhaps he may, uh, may assess that Blue and White has a bigger chance to form the government. So... So the president could sort of uh, uh, make other, it would be reasonable for him to make other decisions, but he decided that uh, uh, the rule that will dictate uh, who he allocates the mandate to will be based on the number of recommendations. Initially, Gantz got 57, and then three Arab MKs of the Ballad Party withdrew their recommendation, and Gantz ended up with 54 versus 55 for Netanyahu, and therefore Netanyahu ended up with a, a, a first chance of forming a government, although there are those who say that Mr. Gantz actually preferred not to go first because he wanted Netanyahu to go first and fail, and then it might increase the chance of, of, of some uh, uh, movement or changes within the Likud under the assumption that Netanyahu got the chance and failed, and now someone else, we should give a chance to someone else. Thank you. So another question, and I think you, you broached on this a little bit, um, Yochanan, is that if Netanyahu fails, does the president have the task to, can he give the task to another MK with forming a government, or is it possible that he just announced that he gives up and that they go to another election? Is there that possibility that even though now he first gave the opportunity to Netanyahu that he can give it to somebody else without another election? Yeah, the process was uh, the, the process was uh, illustrated in one of the slides before. The the president grants the per, the MK that has the highest chance to form a government 28 days, and he can also provide them an extension of 14 days. Uh, so that's attempt number one. Then the president, if that candidate is not successful, the president can provide an additional 28 days to another candidate. And should that candidate fail, there is a three-week uh, uh, period in which 61 members of Knesset can sign a letter requesting the president to assign uh, another, uh, uh, any MK to form the government. So there's actually three attempts, uh, and if those three attempts, three potential attempts, if those three attempts fail, uh, then we automatically go for, our, for an election. It's not that there's, there's a need for a majority or a special move or maneuver. 
should those three attempts fail, there's an early election, and therefore uh, we are in attempt number one, uh, and uh, within a few weeks we will uh, know whether uh, we were successful in forming a government or we're going to a ludicrous third round. I still have faith that we will be able to uh, swear in a government within a few weeks. Great. Um, okay, another question for Adnar Yochanan is, can Bibi disperse the, the government again before the president passes the mandate to the next candidate, if that does happen? Well, the gov Mr. Netanyahu dispersed the government previously because he had a majority within the Knesset. Should Mr. Netanyahu, uh, if he will be able to build a majority to dispersing or to dis dissolving the Knesset, then he will uh, be able to do so. But there, there, there is no. It doesn't seem that there is a majority for that. Not, not even among the 55 that uh, uh, consider themselves part of the Netanyahu bloc. They are part of the Netanyahu bloc for negotiating for a coalition, but not for. It's not a bloc for dissolving the Knesset. And of course, the, other, the others won't support it. So I don't think that's a, a relevant scenario at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question, I guess this is for Edna as well. The, the case against the prime minister seems to mostly be about minor questions of press coverage. Are they really serious? Well, I, maybe uh, I'm more of a lawyer, but I see them as very serious uh, mm -hmm. allegations. Uh, I don't think they, they deal only with press coverage, even though press coverage is not an only. Press coverage is our uh, uh, way of learning what's happening in the government, what's happening with the people holding the very uh, strong and, and influential positions. And we do want to be able to, uh, uh, you know, have, have our criticism about them. So free press is a basic, but then I must admit that there are very, very serious allegations here that uh, uh, on top of this important issue of uh, press coverage uh, are very troubling. It's very troubling to uh, learn that uh, the prime minister is uh, accepting gifts or demanding gifts and, and maybe dependent on other people. And it's even more troubling to know that regulatory reforms like uh, uh, tariffs of, of, uh, of uh, telephone uh, can be traded for, uh, for, for his own interest. Might it be a press coverage or other interests? So mm -hmm. this is the basics of what the, the meaning of uh, 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 breaching the, the, our trust as public, uh, our, the public trust in mm. uh, uh, um, a prime minister or any other one who is holding such a, a, a senior position right. a, a cannot be a bitch in this way. So right. we don't know. It hasn't been decided by court. It hasn't been checked all through. But yeah. these allegations are very severe. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm back to you, Yochanan. A question for you. If there is a unity government, won't the ideological differences between Likud and Blue and White, not to mention other partners, ensure a stalemate like we often see here when Congress and the White House are held up by different parties and different, different ideologies? Well, it's a, it's a good question because um, we have some, we look with uh, some level of uh, nostalgia to the unity governments of the 80s that uh, uh, brought the idea out of Lebanon and, and, and fought the hyperinflation and actually had some uh, good achievements. But when it came to uh, some fronts, when it came to foreign policy, diplomacy, relationship with the Palestinians, they were basically uh, 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 in a deadlock and they could not make any decisions and there was a mutual veto power. So such governments have an inherent a drawback uh, However, uh, since the Palestinian issue is not expected to, you know, no, no major breakthroughs are, are expected, or as somebody said cynically, there's no risk of peace breaking out anytime soon. Um, uh, and the Trump plan is probably going to dictate the agenda in the next uh, uh, at least year or so. Um, 
then in this respect, there, there's not going to be much of a difference. When it comes to security policy, uh, questions of how to deal with the Iranian threat, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, those are, there, there are no major ideological differences. It's more a question of competence, leadership, uh, uh, and so on. So I don't think that, and, uh, that, 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 uh, uh, that would be a barrier for creating a functioning national unity government. And on the other hand, the two major parties, on, as mentioned before, in questions of electoral reform, constitutional, entrenching constitutional values, um, uh, religion and state, uh, and, and so on, they, they can actually reflect a broad consensus among Israelis and, and lead to breakthroughs and, and, and structural reforms that uh, we have uh, waited for for a long time. Thank you. So here's another question about just Israeli um, history and policy. In Israeli history, has there been attempts to limit the amount of terms a prime minister can undertake, as in the United States when a president can only serve for two terms in a row? If so, why have they failed and has it been attempted? Well, electoral, you know, in Israel, Israel is a parliamentary system. In parliamentary systems, term limits are, are much less acceptable. In a presidential system, a president has much power over the exec executive, and it makes sense to limit it to uh, two terms. The president appoints so many people and, uh, and, and, and gets a personal mandate, and, and, and therefore it makes sense to limit it. In a parliamentary democracy, we do not elect people, we elect parties, and parties rule, and there's more flexibility for a party to change uh, whoever is on top, for coalitions to form and, uh, and reform again. So there's more flexibility to deal with, uh, 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 with uh, say, uh, leaders that go astray, and, uh, and therefore there's less logic. You know, sometimes coalitions change during a term, so how do you define a term? Uh, so there's less logic of, uh, uh, of term limits. Um, we think that electoral reform uh, that will really change and stabilize the Israeli system should include other elements. But surely uh, there are those who are trying to promote an Israeli system, including Mr. Gantz himself, has put forward a proposal for uh, 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 term limits under the assumption that uh, uh, too much power for too long uh, uh, does not... Does, uh, n uh, does not do much good neither for the country nor for the individual that holds on to this power. Thank you. Um, Edna, do you, have, do you have something to add to that? I, I think uh, it can be a, a connected to the immunity question. Mm -hmm. you know, um, Prime Minister was uh, talking about immunity uh, issue before these uh, last elections and it was part of the issues raised after the previous ones, um, an immunity does not uh, a, a fit into a system where a prime minister can be in office for so many years. It, it can fit into a system where uh, a prime minister has a, a, a short period of time or uh, a, a limit of uh, his um, governance. Um, the same, same goes for the investigations and accusations. Some systems um, have um, uh, different uh, uh, arrangements for accusing or even uh, uh, investigating uh, prime ministers while in office, but this doesn't work in a system where you can actually be in office for so many years and be elected again and again and again as the head of the party. So this is why prime minister is now under investigations, accusations or indictment and all these questions I was talking before are relevant in our system. Thank you. Okay. And we're just about time at this point. So I want to thank everybody that, that participated. I want to thank Yochanan and Edna for your, your time and explaining a really complicated situation that changes. It seems like it changes every hour. So thank you for keeping us so current on, on all of this. And thank you to IDI's partnership in bringing all of these briefings these last few months to, to JFN members. We really appreciate that. 
Thanks Thank for you. having us. Shana Tova, everybody. Thank you. Shana Tova. Thank you.